a very warm welcome from my side. I'm very happy that you are all here. Today we will talk about the situation of refugees in Libya, their struggles and their demands. My name is Karen Schamberger. I'm uh, working at Medico International uh, as a responsible for flight and migration. Uh, the, the event will be held in English, but uh, I, as I have asked before, everybody understood, understands English, so that's no problem. Um, this is not uh, an event solely done by Medico International. It's, a, it, it's an event which is organized by ProSU by Alarm Phone Hanau and by Medico International. I'm very happy that we three organizations came together to this, today's event. Is there somebody coming? Yes, yes let's wait for him. Then. So, what is special about the today's event is that we are not talking about refugees, but with someone who has experienced the situation himself until very recently. Um, I very warmly welcome David Yambio, who just recently made it to Italy from Libya. Welcome, David. It's very important to see refugees not just as victims or objects, but as acting subjects who can say no and who show resistance to the violent European border regime. And David was a key person in the protest of thousands of refugees last year in front of the UNHCR office in Tripoli. Uh, I think it was an historic act of self-organization by refugees under the harshest conditions and also an act of resistance against the European border regime. And at that time, the protesting refugees demanded, among, amongst other, other things, first, the ev evocation of all refugees to safe countries, second, fair treatment of all refugees by the UNHCR Libya, and third, no to the European Union funding of the so-called Libyan Coast Guard and the detention camps in Libya. You also had some other demands, but I think you can present them even better than I'm doing it. The demonstrations, the, the demonstrators were threatened and attacked, but still stuck to their demands. Even though the sit-in in front of the UNHCR was broken up with violence and hundreds of demonstrators were detained in January, January this year, they have not given up the political struggle for, or, or their hope. The demands are still relevant and the struggles continue in different forms. David, he fled the war in South, South Sudan and was very key or instrumental in organizing the protests in Tripoli last year. He was one of its spokesmen. And after the crackdown of the protests, he went into hiding for several months for fear of arrest and repression. And in the summer of this year, of 2022, he managed to escape to Italy, where he has since been, rec been recognized as a political refugee. And I'm really very curious and glad that you will report on the current situation in Libya. And after that, uh, after your presentation, we can have a discussion, especially uh, how we can support the refugees in Libya from here, from Europe. And after your presentation, there will be also a short uh, talk by Hagen, uh, who will tell us something about the ongoing protest or the protest which will take place in front of the UNHCR in Geneva on December 9th and 10th, uh, which is um, also an important uh, event. Uh, the duration of the event will be uh, until 9 p.m. maximum, depends on how we will discuss. And the, the, the event is also recorded, but just the presentation is recorded, not the discussion, so we can freely discuss after we shut down the recorder. So, David, as I'm a bit sick, I will sit uh, in the audience. We <laughs> talked about it before, and you have the floor now. Thank you so much for coming. 
I know the weather and it's evening, everybody wants to dine with their family. But uh, I appreciate those of you who have taken your time to come. Uh, and I'm happy that I'm here with you today, thanks to the endless effort of uh, the teams that were able to bring me all the way from Italy. It has not been an easy thing to do. Uh, thank you, Hagen, thank you, Medico, and thank you, Brazil. Thank you. Well, as he just mentioned that, uh, uh, that refugees should not be just seen as an object or uh, incapable uh, uh, creatures. We are humans. For these reasons, I think, uh, before telling the struggles of the refugees in Libya, you have to know that what is forcing people to migrate, what is pushing people to leave their countries, why will someone decide to leave all the way from South Sudan, crossing countries, crossing the, the Sahel Desert, arriving to Libya? And not only that, but hop onto a rubber dingy boat, which is unseaworthy, to set on a journey to cross the Mediterranean, to try to reach uh, the Lampedusa Island, and so on. Which means that I was someone, I'm somebody who was born in a civil war country in, in Sudan in 1997, not being able to choose where to be born. Only at the age of two months old, my family had to free the country because of civil war. They fled to the neighboring country, to Congo, and then Central Africa. They lived there for some years. Seven years later, they returned back to South Sudan after a comprehensive peace agreement was signed between the, the rebel party and the, the government of Sudan. Few years then, I was a victim of, uh, of child abduction. I was abducted by foreign uh, rebels from Uganda, the Erale. <coughs> At the age of 12, I was forcibly conscripted to fight with these rebel groups and living away without my family, hindered from all my fundamental human rights. I had to live with this for a year, and in 2010, I escaped from them, and I got repatriated from the country where I escaped from. And then I was repatriated back to my country. I got reunited with my family, and I started to live again like any other human being. <coughs> a year later, the war between Sudan came to an end, and there was a, a resolution where the southern part of the country got its independence. And today, there's two Sudan, the North Sudan and the South Sudan, and I come from the southern part of the country. This was not enough. Only two years later, after our independence, South Sudan went into another civil war, which I think some of you already know the civil war which started in South Sudan in 2013, to this day that I'm speaking. <coughs> this civil war has claimed the lives of more than 400,000 people have died, and more than 2 million have fled into exile. And I'm one of the people who have fled, who have been forced to leave their homes, who have been forced to stay without a family, who have been forced to stay in circumstances where humans are not supposed to be. I left my country because of all these indifferences, persecution, my inability or my unwillingness to be part of a bloodshed regime. I chose to become a refugee because in my country, if you want to survive, you have to take up clashing cough and then to kill someone in order to survive. And as old as I am, as old as I was getting, the age of 18, I found myself accountable. If I was to participate in the war, if I was to kill my neighbors just to survive, I didn't see any human value in myself. Then I chose to become a refugee and I fled to the Republic of Sudan, the Northern Sudan, but I was not given shelter, given the religious indifferences. I was not able to be sheltered in, in that country. I moved on, I went to the Republic of Chad. 
in Chad. That was in 2016. I was given international protection under the Geneva Refugee Convention. And I lived there, but the situation was very poor. We look at Chad also as, a very, as one of the poorest countries in Africa, yet it's hosting more than 6 million refugees from Sudan, from the Darfur genocide, from Central Africa, from Cameroon, from the Boko Haram, the ICC in Nigeria. Most of these people who had fraud from the neighboring countries, they went to Chad. And Chad has received them very well without complaining, like what we see today. This was not enough for me to receive protection. My, my story, the fact that I was pushed to leave my country, to leave a society where I was born and raised, it was not enough for the <coughs> Libyan society, for the Libyan authorities, because when I arrived in Libya in 2018, what I found upon my arrival was only nightmares made of torture, exploitations, humiliation, slave enslavement, forced labor, and forced conscription. When I arrived to the common people like you, who are just citizens, I was someone, an invader coming to invade Libya to take their resources, to fill the vacancies where they will no longer have jobs. And to the government, I was something to be instrumentalized to be used for politics. And during war times, I was a shield which they could use to shield themselves, to send to the war fronts, because they looked at me as not to be human. They looked at me and thought that they could not be held accountable for their actions towards me. <coughs> and when I say me, it means that I'm talking about thousands of people who have lived this, in these conditions. I'm talking about thousands of people who are fled from the war in Afghanistan, people who are fled from the civil war in Syria, people who are fled from the climate change, from the poverty in the Sahel region, people who are coming from East Africa, from Eritrea, people who are fleeing, who don't want to be forcibly conscripted into the army, people who are coming from Somalia, who does not want to be part of the Al-Shabaab, Daesh regime? People who are afraid in the civil war, the genocide in Darfur and lived in Chad. But because of poverty, they moved to Libya to work until there is peace in Darfur and they could return back. But this never happened. We found an existing mechanism, a mechanism designed to kill without a touch because it was a, a moment where Europe and its member states <coughs> started to fund a mafia system to kill without a touch. For us, we, the refugees, someone who has lost his daughter to this agreement, someone who has lost his sister, his mother, his family members, his loved one, his colleagues to this agreement, we don't call it a memorandum or whatever, we call it an act of international terrorism, which Europe, Italy, Malta is committing in Libya. Because it is not killing nationals from Sudan only, it's killing people from Afghanistan, from Syria, from Bangladesh, the Middle East, and all of Africa. We lived with this, and given these conditions that I just mentioned, I was forced to take on the rubber dingy boards, only to be pushed back, not only once. <coughs> and with each time that I was pushed back, I was sent to detention centers. These detention centers are fully funded by the Italian government and by other EU member states. I found myself in this limbo, in a circle of repeated violence. I found myself in a situation where I was deliberately silenced for a number of years, four years consecutively with arbitrary detention, working at construction sites for a number of months without being paid, without being given enough food to eat, 
and in detention centers, we don't have access to medical intervention once needed. Women are raped. We became the hidden workforce of the Libyan economy. And the, to the European state, we became an instrument, a source of bargain to have a political interest in Libya, within the North African countries, and in the African politics. We, the people, have been pushed to pay the price in the center of politics. The things, the violation that you have seen, that few journalists have managed to travel to Libya to document and bring to the international community, should have been enough for European state to act, for the West, for the international community to act, to recognize the people, to look at us as human beings. But it was never enough because most of these stories have been filtered. Most of it have been hidden and used for political reasons. And we still continue to suffer. To this day that I speak to you, hundreds of thousands of people across and within Libya are still held in human conditions. Their voices are not listened to as a voice. Their faces are not looked upon as human faces. Their value of life are not regarded worth anything, but an easy source of income, a business model to the traffickers, to a few <coughs> political leaders, to institutions that does not want people to have a freedom of movement. These things were not enough for the Libyan government. They wanted a full control over our bodies, the bodies of our women, the bodies of young health men that they wanted to carry the crashing cough, that they wanted to go and do the ammunition, to go and put them in the war fronts. Yet when we looked at the situation, it was not enough. We came at a point where last year, there is a particular neighborhood west of Tripoli. <coughs> it is called Gilgaresh. This place was a makeshift accommodation for the people, for us. They gave us different names. They said we were refugees, we were asylum seekers, we were economic immigrants. For us, we do not want to be called refugees. We look at ourselves as human beings. We look at ourselves as people who want a second chance in life. We look at our, at ourselves as people who do not want to contribute and to chill in a society in order to live. We are people who want to exist in a peaceful circumstance, to have opportunities for ourselves where we can educate, nourish ourselves. But under these circumstances, there is already a name designed by international community, by international NGOs like UNHCR, IOM, that these are refugees. We accepted that. But it was not enough for the Libyan state. They accused the neighborhood of engaging in drug, <coughs> selling, selling of arms. If I was a refugee who did not want to participate in war, I left my country. Would I come to Libya to fight, to take arms to sell, or to invade a country? The simplest answer is no. But for political reasons, we were criminalized and they attacked the neighborhood. More than 5,000 people, children, pregnant women, elderly disabled, victims of trafficking who survived detention centers. They took them, they raided the neighborhood, crashed our homes, our belongings were stolen, all the things confiscated. People taken to inhuman conditions in detention camps. And these official detention camps are fully funded and officially funded by the Italian government. People were put in inhuman conditions for days. They lived without water, without food, without a place to sleep, not even a place to stand. People standing one on the one leg and others giving space to put the other leg. We looked at this condition. We looked at the existing uh, international NGOs within Libya, IOM, UNHCR, MSF. 
Nobody was denouncing the situation. We were a monkey on the national television to the Libyan society. Those of us who survived when the raids happened on the 1st of October last year, we went immediately. I went immediately to the UNHCR headquarters because I had nothing on me. I had a mobile cell phone, asylum certificate, and a few coins with me that I managed to take when I was running. When I arrived to the UNHCR headquarters, I knocked on their door that, look, everyone I knew, as vulnerable as they were, they are is still not given any attention, yet they are taken to inhuman condition in concentration camps. Why are you not able to advocate for them? And as for me, immediately I need <coughs> protection. I can't go to the Libyan government who just brought armored tanks, drones, as if we were terrorists to attack us. I wanted to get out of the country. They said, we have limited mandate to operate in Libya. We cannot give you any source of protection. I was hopeless. I was a young man, able to endure pain, able to endure starvation. But when I looked at other people who were shot at during this development, and I looked at the pregnant women who just wanted a place where to give birth and they could not access the public hospital, I looked at the people, elderly disabled men who crippled all the way to the front office of the UNHCR, hoping to be sheltered, but they were turned away. I decided, I said, someone has to do something. If it means dying, we must die for something worth it. We must die while trying to be recognized. We must die while trying to be listened to. We must die when we have a story to tell and a face to be looked at. I understood that the international media were not ready to come to document what was happening. Local journalists were not able to come to the UNHCR headquarters to look at the conditions of the people. That was when we understood that the only way to come out of this was to start mobilizing ourselves, to be able to tell our stories, to be able to educate ourselves about our fundamental human rights regardless of being in Libya, regardless if we, were, we are in Italy, in the host community, once we leave our country, to look at ourselves as human beings, equally as people in Europe, equally as people in the Americas, equally as people in the Middle East, in Asia, and across Africa. That was the first point, that was the first principle, the first goal that we wanted to achieve. And we did it throughout the difficulties, we started to mobilize ourselves and we started to protest. Just to give you a little image about what the international media were able to, to portray, there is a short thing from uh, Al Jazeera. I'm not finding it. <laughs> They've been here for days, some for more than a week. They're hungry and thirsty, and they've been sleeping on the dirt. People give them water as they pass by the crowd of migrants outside this UN facility in Tripoli. They each have a story to tell. Mohammed Dawood says he escaped from the Mabani detention center on Friday and has been here ever since. So we are homeless. We have no place to go. The UN here is the responsible. Should we be looking into it? It was to take it the responsibility. It follows a crackdown by Libyan security services earlier this month in the town of Gurgadish, where at least 5,000 migrants and refugees were arrested. Their temporary homes were destroyed. The government says they were built illegally on public land. Those arrested were put in detention centers like the El Mabani facility, where on Friday 2,000 people escaped. The UN said six migrants were killed and at least 24 injured. Uh, we began a pilot program today to provide cash assistance and emergency relief 
for some of these people and will continue to do so um, uh, in these areas around town in the next couple of days. We've been unable to do so at the community day center because of the large crowds. Libya has long been a transit hub for migrants and refugees attempting to reach European shores by crossing the Mediterranean. But with the recent crackdown, many of them are scared. They gather here in their hundreds outside this UN facility, hoping to be relocated to other countries. Women and children are among the crowds who are waiting for help. The UN Refugee Agency says it urges the crowd to disperse so they can help the most vulnerable in need. But most people here tell us they have nowhere else to go and they refuse to leave until they are evacuated. David came to Libya from South Sudan. He says migrants and refugees are made to wait in Libyan detention centers because of EU policies and restrictions. The European Union, who are finding the, the Libyan Coast Guard, <coughs> you are then uh, intercepted in the sea and then brought back to Libya, where they have held up in different detention centers. And uh, not only that, the, the militias, as we might call it, they, are, they, they took these people and separated them into groups where they extort them or detain them for ransom. And, uh, you know, this cycle keeps repeat, repeating itself. There are an estimated 600,000 African migrants in Libya at the moment. Many of them just want a better life for themselves and their families. And they believe they'll find it in Europe. Now, China, Al Jazeera, Tripoli. At the point of our protest, this is what the international media was able to do. And afterward, they couldn't access the center because they were blocked by the Libyan authorities because they didn't want us to have a voice. They never wanted us to have a face. They never wanted us to testify to the horrors. <laughs> Three months, more than three months, this was the situation. More than 5,000 people protested daily for three consecutive months, tirelessly, because they wanted a voice. They wanted to die trying to be recognized. We kept on knocking on the fortress Europe, we kept on writing to the Italian authorities, to the EU parliament in Brussels. But we were not given any attention, only for very few interested individuals, civil societies. And Pope Francis, he was one of the few people from the church members that sent his closeness, that sent his solidarity, that he was feeling our pain, that he knew what we were going through. Throughout the struggle, on the ground, we couldn't do. We had to f do different ways to use what was available at our disposal. These things, being able to broadcast it, we were not trained how to speak on the media. We only had few cell phones. It became a lifeline for the people. The cell phone, the only thing which I had, became the voice to every one of us. It became the lifeline for the people. People, for us to buy internet data, for us to buy, to have access to internet, to charge their phone. <clears throat> Women and children who were angry, instead of buying bread, they contributed the few <coughs> points that they had to buy resources, how to speak, how to bring a voice to, to themselves. 
They stay days without water, without access to toilet. How many of you here today spent a day since morning without going to toilet? We were merely living and surviving by the sidewalk inside Tripoli with access to no basic necessity. All the humanitarian organizations in Libya ignored our call, ignored our protest, ignored our story. It was unbearable for all of us, but we continued. We had to do it. Yet we were met with a lot of repression. I don't know this is, this is the best thing. I'm sorry. I'm coming from no problem. jungle. <laughs> Thank you. So as I mentioned, throughout the protest, protesting in the street was not enough. We wanted to reach the international community. And for us to do so, it means that we have to use what was available at our disposal. We started using Twitter because we protested for five days and nothing happened. No one gave us any notice. The UNHCR was ignorant of the situation. So we created a Twitter page because we understood it was one of the different uh, tool to use where politicians across Europe and throughout the world are using. On the 5th of October, we created a Twitter page and we named ourselves Refugees in Libya. We started documenting from inside what was happening, women who were shot at, those who were raped. We gave all these testimonies without filters. Some of it were blocked by Twitter, but we kept on resisting. We kept on doing what was necessary. We kept on trying to be recognized, to have a voice was not enough. Afterward, we created a website because the Twitter was not enough also. For us to be recognized, we had to have a website where journalists, if they wanted to do something, could go and collect these testimonies. We started, as you can see, to, to call on the world to listen to our voices because we were there to give a signal that there is someone here. There is a life, there is a human face that needs to be recognized. There is someone with the will to exist only, but as a result of politics, as a result of the memorandum between Italy and Libya, we are none of this. We have been criminalized, we have been instrumentized, and then put in the center of politics. We continued, we were met with a lot of repressions. People kept on knocking, People kept on wanting to be listened to. We had to draw different kind of things, which means that circumstances make men. People who are not <coughs> well trained to do to use internet, to use all this website, IT information, they were able to create things out of nowhere using their mobile cell phones, trying to indicate that we are here in front of the units, here headquarter with the location. As you can see, people sleeping in the street. It was very inhuman. It was a situation beyond our human endurance. <laughs> These were one of the demands and explaining what I just spoke about, why we had to protest, why we had to give a voice to, to ourselves. <clears throat> now, we talk about uh, international support. For three months, it was not enough for 5,000 people. This support, well wishers across Europe organized a, organized a crowdfunding where they collected some funds and sent to the people. They sent this money to us. We used it mostly to buy medicine because we knew that some, some people could endure, could stand being hungry for days, but people who wanted immediate medical inter intervention could die if we didn't use the money for medication because we could not access the public hospital. We could not just walk two kilometers away without being kidnapped, without being shot at by the militias. And for people who wanted to access public hospital, we were denied because they say we are not Libyan, we are not supposed to be in Libya, and we are not humans. So this support was necessary. 
though it was very little, it saved a lot of lives. It gave hope to the people. It gave hope for our resistance. And we kept on resisting. There were some solidarity. People who tried to protest across uh, European cities in solidarity with our movement, in solidarity with our call to be recognized. But it was not enough because after three months, the protest was violently evicted and all the people were taken to Enzaga Detention Center to this moment that I speak to you. We are coming to that part. At the same time also, we were able to negotiate to sit on the table with the UNHCR and the, with the Libyan authorities, as you can see, but nothing changed. All they gave us were empty promises that we are going to improve the situation. We are going to close at Mabani, where these people were detained. They did, but they opened a new one, which means that they try to tell the international community, okay, we are cooperating with these people, but yet tomorrow they go and open many more of these uh, in human detention center. Our negotiation with the government, with the UNHCR, were fruitless. We achieved very few things because at that time of our protest, most of the year, most of the months of uh, 2021, all the humanitarian uh, flights leaving Libya and coming to Libya were suspended. But thanks to the protest, we were able to open these uh, humanitarian evacuation <laughs> flights it resumed after we negotiated for days and for weeks with the Italian, with the Libyan authorities. But also we look at the repressions. These were militias. They came day and night trying to evict the, the garrison, trying to take the people to the detention center. But I had to stand there. People had to face them, to put our life in the front line, to tell them it is not right. It is not just to come and take people who just want to exist, to take them to the detention center. It happened, so we paid the price immediately. There were a loss of life. Once they failed to take the people to the detention center, they shot at us. People got wounded, and people, as you can see, I didn't want to bring more uh, images. People were shot at and died on the 12th of October. A young, a uh, 17 year old, Refugee from Sudan was shot at and he died immediately. And many more who got wounded. And we just felt hopeless. We felt abandoned by the international <coughs> community. Yet we had to resist, we had to continue with the hope that one day we could be listened to. One day we could be recognized by the people in Germany, in Italy, and across Europe. It came also with the, when trying to do something, we had to give this democracy to ourselves, to know what we need, because we were not people from one country. All these people were not from South Sudan. We were 11 to 13 nationalities from Asia, East Africa, Central, West, and then the North Africa. All people, they came, we came together in unity, trying to be recognized. So we have to give this sense of democracy to know who want to have a voice, who want to speak, who is capable. And even those who felt themselves valueless, we gave them the value that they are still humans. We had to do endless meetings before we could decide, before we could execute any idea. You were a pity to the passersby. You can <laughs> see this is a highway where people, cars move, Yet you can see there are shelters, plastic sheets. It was a rainy season. It rained on us day and night. And we couldn't just survive lack of shelters. It was not enough for the people to be, to, to be sheltered here because UNHCR completely abandoned us. They shut their doors and went away. They didn't want to support <coughs> newborns. Pregnant women could not access the public hospital, even during rebel. As cruel as I am, I had to help three women give birth. I had to pull kids from their head because there, there was nothing I could do more than this. I had to take up myself to do what I could do. We helped and a new life came. We named him Saraj after the street where we were 
protesting. And thankfully today, uh, with all the advocacy, uh, the, the family got resettled in uh, Sweden. They are safe and uh, if I'm sure if they were here, they would be very happy to speak to you. So these were the challenges that we faced. These are things lack of toilets. People had to use the plastic bottles that the, the Libyan throw at them and use it for different uh, reasons, how to survive. <coughs> you can look at women, children, and I'm sorry for this picture. As I said before, we were pity to the passersby because the cars moving on the 27 onward until January this year, we had more than seven accidents. And out of that, those seven accidents, at least uh, three people died. One of them is this young boy from Eritrea. <coughs> he was a 14 year old boy. What was his crime to come to Libya? To have fried the false conscription. He didn't want to fight in Eritrea. He fried wanting to exist in a peaceful circumstance where he could achieve what he wanted in life, where he could achieve education to nourish himself. But he missed all these opportunities and his life was nothing. You can look at people, children, young has seven years, dying from the car accident, the repression, aggressiveness from the neighbors who didn't want us to be at the neighborhood because they found us a threat. Even under normal circumstances, we were, we were a threat to them making noise there and night, so it's normal to complain that you're making noise to us, but we have no other option than to resist, than to talk to the neighbors that we do not want to be here, but the situation, the circumstance from your government is forcing us to be in the street. Lack of food has a mission. A lot of things has happened. People in this circumstance, we can imagine 5,000 people Day and night with the starvation, people still had hopes. They had to play whatever able. They were able to do to play games, to pass time, to to nurture the mind, to be able to convince the, the stomach that it can resist. If there is hunger, if there is thirst, there is something much more to do. Health facilities. Most of the ambulances they came when we needed them, but they got blocked by the Libyan authorities no more humanitarian services to the place where we were protesting. And it was not enough. You can see more of the challenges. The situation was really very inhuman to be here. Sorry, what is the definition again? <laughs> Go to the videos. Thank you. So I'm really sorry, this was how people had to survive in the street, because I've taken much, much time, but uh, this is the situation. And so he's trying to watch because he has spent weeks without him. This I cannot tell you even to imagine being in such a situation where, because in Europe today I know there are washing machines. When I arrived in Italy, I was just fascinated. I looked at things, press zero, and then it starts, and everything is clean, and it smells nice. But I had to recall the situation of the people. How could I forget that there are still people who need my voice? How could I have a good night's sleep after arriving in Italy? To look at the situation that I had to endure, to even imagine that there is someone who will be forced to migrate and arrive to Libya to live the same situation that I had to go through. For these reasons, I did not stop and I will not stop. I'm here with you today to talk about this situation. 
the way people had to survive all in the street, as you can see. This is a food for 5,000 people. During the nights, you can imagine, the sound is too much, but people sleeping in such conditions, in very harsh condition, weather, cold weathers, they slept two kilometers by the sidewalk because they wanted to be seen as humans, because we wanted to have a voice. But it was not enough, not even sleeping in such condition. It was not enough for the Libyan authorities to stop committing these crimes. It was not enough <coughs> for the EU member state to look at us, to regard migration as a human right, as a human nature. There are more things that I can show, but we don't have time to, to show, and it will never change the reality. But this is what we have been going through in Libya for a number of years. Although it is documented, it is not told the way it is supposed to be told. If you are strong enough, I would have shown you a certain video here, but I'm afraid some of you are not able even to have eyes to look at how people can be burned alive for money by traffickers. This young man from Sudan. He was at the protest, he got kidnapped, and he was dozed into diesel, burnt alive, and then he was dumped in the street. We picked him, we took him to the hospital, six months of treatment, but it was not enough, and his life ended there, just like the life of many more. I'm sorry that you have to see this. It's one of the untold stories. It's one of the things that you cannot see on the big media houses. When I look at these people, they are humans like me. I looked at them as brothers. I looked at them and I valued their life, even if they wanted to become anything in life, if they wanted to become teachers. You could, they could tell different stories. I want to become an entrepreneur. I want to become a journalist. I want to become a teacher. I want to become a doctor so I can I could save lives. I want to become someone who can contribute to a beautiful society. But as refugees, as victims of this memorandum, mm -hmm. arriving on the Mediterranean, thousands of people, 25,000 since 2017, more than 25,000 lives have perished, have drowned in the Mediterranean. It has become a graveyard. As a result of this agreement, of these political indifferences, there are none of these. All there are are, as you have seen, places where they can be burned, places where they can be buried in the desert, places where they can drown deep into the depths of the Mediterranean, and not to be looked for, not even for their dead body. We protested for three months and 10 days, after that, on the 10th of January, our protest was violently evicted. Women of the same situation that you have seen, who were struggling even to have a bread each day, were taken to inhuman concentration camp, a detention center funded by Italy to this moment that I speak with you. More than 600 of them were taken. And then, to this day, more than 300 of them are still there. UNHCR neglected us. 
Yonetisia failed the people. Yonetisia did not stand up to its responsibility. Yonetisia did not defend its mandate in Libya. They defended the Libyan territory. They protected the Libyan borders. They abandoned us. There were people, women, children who wanted a voice. These were women with the asylum certificate, with document of the UNHCR, but yet they were abandoned. Sorry, the voice is not. With all these faces that you see, children in the background, who, who doesn't deserve to be put in these conditions, even if, if they committed a crime, children of such age are not supposed to be put in prisons, according to the law that we know. But it was not enough. The protest was dismantled, in which they thought that we were going to be silenced. When it was dismantled, those of us who survived again, we went into the hide, and we continued to advocate, to document, and to tell the international community what was happening. Personally, has, I was seen as an outspoken person, as one of the founder of this movement. I was persecuted by the Libyan government. Three times I was shot at, at my place. My roommate, they shot them and they died, and I survived that. At the same time, I reached the Italian authority to ask for a humanitarian visa to come to Italy but I was denied access. I had to take on the rubber dingy boat again for the five times. And with all the sufferings, my time came up and I arrived at the end of June. Still, we continued to document, to tell their stories because day and night, <coughs> I don't sleep. I'm still in touch with the people in the concentration camps the people who are in Libya, on the Mediterranean. And together, in Europe today, our protest is growing. That's why you are able to see me here. With the help of the Solidarity Network, Solidarity Alliance, which have been able to unify civil societies across Europe, not only in Italy, but in Germany, in France, in Spain, in Barcelona. And it comes, the first, simultaneous protest with the solidarity with refugees in Libya was last month in October, the 15th of October, there was a simultaneous protest throughout uh, the European cities and different European countries to denounce the renewal of the memorandum between Italy and Libya. Unfortunately, uh, it seemed as if the efforts were not enough the memorandum got renewed by the new Italian government, but this did not stop us. We still continue to call on the Fortress Europe to look at the people as humans, to protect and give protection to people who seek asylum on its borders, and to stop this brutal border regime, border externalization, all the way to the southern part of Mediterranean and the Balkan routes. There is so much. And for the unfair treatment of the UNHCR that you have seen in the last video, we launched a campaign together with the Solidarity Network 
with different uh, teams here in Hano, Alamfon, civil uh, societies across Europe, sea rescue organizations. We launched a call which is say, called unfair treatment or unfair UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agents. I will look for it if I can find it here. I have once again, I won't need your help. Okay, I found it. Now there is an ongoing campaign against the UNHCR, a call to bring the voice from Tripoli to Geneva. Because when we protested, 5,000 human faces, 5,000 individuals, we expected UNHCR to even denounce, to even call a state of emergency. Because when our homes were raided, the first priority for UNHCR to do was to call and to tell the international community that we were in a state of emergency, that Libya does not respect the international law, that Libya is part of the international and the global society. It has a legal obligation to protect the people within its territory, but UNHCR was silent. They shut their door in our faces. And just before, three days before, our protest was violently evicted. The UNHCR permanently closed their office. They took their assets and left the building. The flag, which was a sign of protection, the UNHCR flag, which was a protection to us at its uh, headquarters, once dropped down, the military came, thousands of them. They came and raided us, they burnt the tents. Women were taken to Enzara Detention Center, as I mentioned. For these reasons, we want to carry this voice. I cannot say my voice because I still feel the pain. I still cannot sleep over it, that I have to go. I have to endure such pain for four years without being listened to. With UNHCR watching passively without denouncing the situation, just because it receives its fund from the state, it has not been able to confront the authorities and to tell them that what they're doing is unjust that what Europe is doing, pushing people back to inhuman conditions, is a crime against humanity and a crime against the international law. UNHCR have not been able to do this, at least without being filtered. For these reasons, we launched this campaign and we call on all of you to support our call to come to Geneva on the 9th and 10th if you really could imagine yourself because at this point, the common power that the people in Libya, that me and you, we share together is only imagination. For us, when we are in Libya, we, we are able to imagine that we can be like these people, like you, being able to access education, being able to fly from here to Spain, to dine with your loved ones, being able to go to England and access education that you want. This is our imagination. So in return, we want you to share the common power of imagination, to imagine your daughters being put in such inhuman condition that they are not listened to, that they are not looked at as human beings, that they are seen as sexual object, that they are seen as a business model, that they are seen as a workforce, an instrument to be used. For these reasons, if you are able to share this power with us, we call on you to contribute with your ideas. I also want to tell you that there is a misconception today with journal, with the activists. They are pushed away by people telling them that if you are a white person, if you live in German and you have a decent life, you are not supposed to speak for other people. When we still have human value, and if we still have human value, it is our core responsibility as individuals, as society, as groups, to denounce violence, whatever it is, regardless of the color, regardless of the value of the background, regardless of wherever we are coming from. Because when we look at our human values, when we look at whatever qualities we have, we start with our fingers, 10 fingers that we have. It is the same that people in America, that people in Europe today have. 
It is the same ability to speak that we still share in common. It is the same two legs that we are using to walk well in the street. So why don't we treat, why don't we look at humanity as something which is going to, which is slowly fading away because of politics. And this politics, we are part of this politics, yet we are excluding ourselves away from it. We elect our people, we elect our members of parliament, we give key positions to government institutions and we elect them. When it comes to decision making, we do not care to know, we do not confront these authorities if they are transparent about this system, if they are transparent about the decision that they are making on our behalf. Because these decisions that the Prime Minister in Germany, for example, is making, he's making it in the name of the German state. Who is the German state? It's common people like you. We should not exclude ourselves from politics. Politics is everywhere, in our daily lives, in our homes, with our loved one. We all use politics to come together. We have to use politics also to become a global and a better society. This is one thing we can request of you. Has for resources, how to contribute for the voice of refugees in Libya. There is so much to do to support the movement. The people in Libya, as you have seen, with the renewal of the agreement, there is a lot of pushback. They live in inhuman condition. Victims of sexual violence, they still need support when they live street in the streets. They need financial support to be able to find shelter, to be able to find the medication, to be able to find food where they can what they can eat. With your support, they are able. If you're not able, rent as your voice. Be a voice. This is stories that you see on the newspaper. It's private to your loved ones. It start from where you are, within your household. Then it stretch out to your schools, to your colleagues, to your working place. Because solidarity and responsibility start at home. For these reasons, I will touch a sensitive topic about Ukraine. When we were in Libya, I was in Libya when the war started and I was on hide. I was being shot at. And I asked the Italian government to let me in, and they said no. At the same time, hundreds of thousands of people were coming from Ukraine. We, the refugees, we find every loss of life has a tragedy. For these reasons, we never regarded it as a racism towards the people. We regarded it as human nature to perceive what is closer to them. It is human nature to feel what happens. If your daughter dies, you will feel it. But if a daughter dies of someone next to you, your neighbor, you will not feel really the pain until your own happens. So this time the war was happening in Europe and people were able to look at, to see every day on the television, women being pushed away. How does it feel to leave home when you don't want to? How does it feel to, to say, I want to become a refugee because home is no more a home to me? The Europeans, the Italians, people in Germany, they felt this, and they were able to share the solidarity. So we also ask for this kind of solidarity, to extend, because solidarity cannot be selective. In this way, it, can, it cannot be called solidarity. We need to extend it more to the Southern Mediterranean, to the Middle East, to the Afghan, to Syria, to Sudan, to Nigeria, to Senegal, people wanting to migrate because they want to exist in a peaceful circumstance. This is our call, this is our demand for individuals, for people willing to be part of the global improvement of a global society which can be welcoming for everybody. Thank you. much David for sharing your uh, experience with us and what you shared with so many people. I'm sorry I have to replace Karen who can't stop coughing. That's why I came here and he asked me to take over. Hagen, I don't know, you would 
say something at the end. I think um, it was so impressive to, to listen to David. Um, I think also sharing your way to Libya already was quite impressive to most of us, what you experienced before coming to Libya and what you experienced in Libya. And um, also the protests you organized in such harsh conditions in front of the UNHCR headquarter in Tripoli. So maybe I would open up immediately to questions from your side. Are there any or comments? <coughs> no? If not, I would have a question maybe to break the ice. Um, you were complaining about UNHCR not doing its job to protect <coughs> refugees in Libya. What was your impression? The role UNHCR sees for itself in Libya? You were talking about the mandate, they were talking about mandate restrictions. You know that from many places in the world. Um, anytime there are complaints about UNHCR, they are hiding behind a mandate um, that is not giving space for real protection. But what was your impression? What is UNHCR doing in Libya, really? Well, from my experience, I know that the UNHCR have been existing in Libya since uh, at least for the last uh, three decades, uh, to say the number, more than 30 years, but without a clear mandate. We know that they have a general mandate according to the Geneva Convention, but existing in Libya, giving false hope to people, registering them, claiming to to be a source of protection to the people, yet they don't do. To this day, they say that they have more than 45,000 people within their database who are in Libya and they need protection. When we look at the international uh, figure mentioned by IOM and the UNHCR of people living in Libya, we see that there are more than 600,000 people who live in Libya. This is also something to touch that most of the people who come to Libya, they come to work in Libya because Libya is one of the richest countries, regardless of the wars of the internal conflict within Libya. Libya is still one of the richest countries in Africa. People come to Libya to work in Libya and to be able to send money to their countries, to their families. But when they are met with this uh, grave human rights violation, they are pushed to take on the Mediterranean. This does not mean that all the people in Libya want to cross the Mediterranean. So with a figure of 600,000 people, UNHCR is only registering 45,000, which means they are selective. They choose where you're coming from to register you, and then the hopes that they give you are nothing. I have seen people who have waited in Libya for 20 years with the asylum procedure. 20 years, they have given birth to children who are not able to go to school. Because when you are an asylum seeker, you cannot access not even the public hospital, not even a public school for your children. They live like a retreat, a retreat society that UNHCR have created in Libya. People are living in a very traumatized life. The asylum process cannot take more than five to 10 years. <coughs> Personally, I waited three years and nothing happened. I left Libya still when I was an unrecognized refugee. Not to mention that I was in Libya with a, when I was in, uh, in Chad, I was a recognized refugee with the, <coughs> under the same convention, which Libya is working in, which the UNHCR in Libya is working under. Why would I have to go again under the same process if it is not unfair treatment? Why don't they look at the information that I have so all this, Libya, I know that after the fall of Gaddafi, the UNHCR, with the, with the, with more growth of the militias, and lack of international staff in Libya, it's only the Libyans who are working on. Each of them are, you know, affiliated to the mafia system, to the militias. So they don't want people to leave Libya, and they don't want people also to, to 
to come to Libya. <coughs> this is the same. It's just like the whole people, when you come in, you don't get out. They keep making money on you. And for the units here, I don't know how to describe it. Because they keep calling for funds, and these funds that they receive in order to improve the situation for the refugees in Libya, there is nothing. We don't have any, not even a camp, not even an urban shelter for the refugees in Libya. Where is the money? Where is the funds going? Yeah, exactly. I think UNHCR is very well financed by um, European and other governments, especially for what they should do in, in, in Libya. So um, my question would be, wouldn't it be more um, effective to ask uh, UNHCR to, to retire from uh, from Libya and to close down and just to say, okay, we are not able to protect, we don't want to uh, fulfill our mandate. So at that moment, uh, refugees and migrants would be left alone in a very harsh con uh, condition, but it would be more obvious. Well, for, for a person like me, at the same time, uh, looking at the situation, of the women, of the children, uh, of weak people who need this support. We cannot tell UNHCR to leave Libya, but we want them to be transparent about their mandate, about what they are able to provide to the people when registering them within their commission. They need to be uh, transparent about the limitation that people can have, the waiting period within Libya, because at the same time, it's doing a few resettlement thoughts to third countries, and then uh, the humanitarian corridors to Italy. We know that it's not enough, but if they are able to lift one life from Libya, it's worth it. Because we look at these people, they could be, they could come today and tomorrow they are in the in the German parliament. They could, they are just like anyone. They could be the president of whatever it is. They could be doctors. So which means each life which is lifted from Libya. It's worth it, but we want them to be transparent. Thank you, Christian, for being clear on that. I think this is very important, and I appreciate it. Are there any other questions or comments? <coughs> I make one comment because in the same context, it's not by accident that we call it unfair. You know we have campaigns that abolish Frontex, it's clear. Frontex, IOM, ICMPD, that's, uh, yeah, migration management and maybe border policy, yeah, in the interest of EU. So it's clear we say, no, we don't want them, we want to abolish them, huh? but we, we uh, use this term or invented now this term and this game with the colors yeah, and with a, this, uh, this symbol, with a logo, in order to say no, unfair means uh, they should do it better. We want not to abolish UNHCR, I think. And, and, and David clearly said, yes, they, it's not nothing, nothing, but it's really, really nothing. And they could do much, much more. At the same time, we know that the nation states are much more powerful behind it and it's not that our campaign now is the end of our solidarity it is one puzzle stone let's say one element you know, uh, in which we try now to give more visibility to the situation and the slogan is still and again amplify you know, the voices of refugees in libya i would also raise another question uh, because uh, you mentioned Ukraine, and you might remember that in the media in Germany this time, there was a lot of reports about Belarus border to Poland. Mm -hmm. And more or less, yeah, really only uh, small reports and, and articles about, I, I would still say it was really a historical protest under these conditions to make a self organized self-organized protest over months with several thousand people, so many nationalities, to bring it together. It's incredible work. And I, st I still feel uh, 
yeah, not really acknowledged, not really appreciated on a level what is needed. Huh? And that is what we still have to do and to <coughs> re-ask also in the movements, huh? why it is so still so invisible or st still only known by two less people. Huh? And to make clear that it uh, has to be highlighted and it's not over, huh? it's still an ongoing challenge for all of us. Um, I have two. There's uh, Andreas. One question. I'm also working with medical. And um, one question about your act, concrete action in, in December and the protest in front of the UNHCR. Um, I think. Did, did you think also to expand this to the, to the, at the same time to other UNHCR offices because it is. Not so easy for migrants, refugees to cross within European borders, so um, which which might be difficult to really gather gather the numbers that you, that you need. I don't know how much you expect to be able to to gather in in Geneva, um, but this might be a way also to show that there are, that this the, um, the protests against UNHCR. Um, is taking place in much more places uh, in countries around Switzerland, and Switzerland has always this very special situation. Yeah. And um, yeah, so that just just yeah. for your strategy or your ideas, what um, how do you plan to make the best the best uh, visibility out of it? Thank you. Could you please pass to um, Hans? <laughs> One question concerning Libya. I think my brain is a kind of bubble, oh. so let me answer him. Ah, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I thought maybe we collect some, but if you prefer. Uh, of I course. Yeah. Computer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, thank you for your question. From the beginning, uh, personally, I thought about it, and uh, we also looked at the conditions of the people. And uh, in the places where we could organize and call for this protest, but uh, the idea was, and the main target was the headquarters in Geneva, because it's the central part of all the, this management. And uh, at the same time, I was looking at the condition of the people who have lived and survived these uh, horrors in Libya. And when they are here in, uh, in Europe, most of them the, they don't want to talk about it, and it's understandably. Uh, that uh, they don't want to go into this uh, flashback moment where they were at the verge of even taking their own lives. So most of the people when they arrive, they don't talk about it. And even if they want to talk about it and take part in this protest, they are met with the bureaucratic issues that uh, they don't have travel documents, they don't have uh, even um, whatever is necessary to work for themselves and be able to, to move within cities. Uh, because I'm speaking from experience, I have hundreds of people who were at the protest, they are now in Italy, and they live in these uh, centers where they are not even to go, allowed to go out more than 72 hours. So this is another prison uh, in Europe, which people find, and they are traumatized. They cannot take part in all these uh, activities. And if you wanted to tell the European uh, society, uh, it's quite uh, disappointing that uh, whenever there is a, a call for event or a protest, I expected that the way in Africa, when there is a call for protest, we go the whole village to show a sign of solidarity. But here in Europe, if you are expecting 2,000, you will find 20. <laughs> so just like today, I was expecting about uh, 200 people. But thankfully, I, <laughs> I got very few of you, and I'm happy. Thank you. I hope I answered your question. Thank you very much, David. Um, Carl, do you want Yeah, so I changed uh, the number of my questions. First, the comment, I, I, it's clear that uh, it's a shame what happened, let's say, uh, after 2019. Uh, the, the whole Libya situation, the, the pressure concern, uh, on the European uh, governments, the German government, okay, also on the UNHCR and IOM, but the key targets for us are the, the people who created the deal, the Libya deal, um, slowed down. And during the pandemic situation, 
I had the impression it's over, it was over, everything very focused on Greece, uh, the horrible situation in the, in the camps, and uh, the, the refugees in India were forgotten. And, uh, and my impression, thing has crossed that this will change now, but my impression is still we, we are, yeah, as you just mentioned, we are not very strong, focused on Libya, we are not, we have not enough. Uh, at the moment, uh, not even to, to stop the cooperation with the Libya Coast Guard. So it's a very simple uh, demand to stop uh, all kinds of cooperations. And we have a, a parliament who pretend to be, the, at the beginning, uh, more human rights based, but nothing is, is changing. So fingers crossed that the, the unfair campaign combined with the, the, the Real targets and the real target is the, okay, the German government, the Italian government, the, the Commission, which is now more uh, is is ongoing a part of the problem. Meanwhile, uh, that we revitalize the let's say the campaign at the beginning of the pandemic situation. It was huge um, meeting in, in Berlin with Kostel, with refugees, with the activists. And it was a crowded meeting. And then COVID started and the focus shifted immediately, not from the radical movement, to Greece. Greece. Only Greece and Libya was forgotten, you were forgotten and all the others. So fingers crossed we revitalize it, but I have not the, 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 the clear plan. And my question, uh, the division of labor between the two twin part, uh, partners, uh, UNHCR, the twins, and IOM. Mm -hmm. In former times, IOM was just a bloody service provider, yeah. but now it's an official <coughs> UN organization. UN agency. Huh? Oh. The UN organization. I, I thought uh, being an UN, but maybe you know, David, being an agency is another thing than that different from being an Yes, it's a UN organization. They have a status now, and they struggled for many years. But the question is, uh, how is the division of labor in Libya, also during the, uh, the strike situation? How was IOM visible and acting in this context? In order to I'm at the point of breaking down when organizations like IOM is mentioned because for IOM I think uh, it's been more of a business because uh, the 17 times that I was held in official detention centers in Libya IOM came at least nine times telling me to go back to South Sudan where I'm framing prosecution because for them it's business the more they repatriate people, the more support they get, the more money they make. Which means that uh, there are people that who are forced to go back against their will. <coughs> and I witnessed this. In 2019, when I was uh, pushed back by a commercial uh, vessel, Lady Sham, I was uh, held up for seven months in Karim. And the IOM, they came and they were telling the militias, to lock us up that until we decide to register with IOM to go back to our countries. People who were not able to resist this, they registered and they went back to Eritrea, to Somalia. It was a pitiful thing to, to see such an organization being managed by, by gangs, by, by mafia. And those of us who wanted to resist, we were kept in uh, in cell rooms without food for seven days, but fear out of nothing, we survived and we because we wanted to be able to tell these stories. We survived <coughs> all this. We had to endure, not from one experience, but many more experiences. IOM is always there when there is war. They are there when uh, people are uh, intercepted and under gunpoint and pushed back to Libya. IOM is there at each disembarkation point, and they name it, people have been disembarked back to Libya, this term that they use. What do you call it, disembarkation, when I'm 
Taurus under gunpoint on the Mediterranean while fraying from horror in Libya. Would I call it disembarkation back to Libya? So IOM doesn't use the term pushed back. They say disembark back to Libya and then they repatriate these people. They arrive there at the disembarkation point, they ask you, do you want to go home? What can we do for you? And then they approach again the detention centers, pushing the militias to torture the people in order to get them go home. This is what is happening because I know as of my situation, nothing could make me go back home and die. I prefer to die where I am. <coughs> it is the same with the people from Bangladesh. They, they know what they are afraid from. It's the freedom that they believe that they own the right to, to migrate for different reasons, for good pay works and, and more of that. The people in West Africa who are fleeing from poor climate circumstances, they do not want to go back to go and starve to death. Libya is still an option where they can work, but they are pushed <coughs> by IOM and they are sent back to, to their countries. Thank you. I, I wonder, David, whether the situation in that even turned worse um, since um, the government of Libya signed an agreement. I read last week uh, there was an agreement signed between the different regions of Libya uh, creating a Libyan agency for return. Do you know about that? Creating? A, a Libyan agency for return. So they even don't have need IOM to return people. I know this. But uh, last week, last Thursday, 200 refugees from uh, Egypt, Sudan, <coughs> and Chad have been returned in cooperation with their embassies. Their embassies were present when they were put into the buses. So I wonder, uh, there is no any light anymore on that situation of uh, forced return, in fact, um, if you have not even uh, international organization, how problematic it might be with regard to, to, to its uh, mandate and the fulfillment of the mandate. What, what did you hear about that, about that agency and how they proceed now? For us, for people like me, we don't hear about, we don't just hear about these agents. We experience it, we feel it. As the, the repatriation through the land borders was happening, I was immediately formed. Because to this day, when the protest was dismantled, we did not stop, we created a, a hotline for people in detention centers, at borders, and even on sea who, who want to reach us and to ask for help. The number you mentioned is just more than that. In the last week, at least uh, 700 people have been uh, returned to district countries, and they are pushed through land borders with these uh, agents that you're saying. We know only when we leave it. We know only when we experience it, because these things, you, when you're in Europe, you have access to all these internet things, and, but in Libya, people don't have these resources. Every day, they try to find a bread to survive on. So this agreement, whatever it is, the agency, there is already a great effect, because recently the EU uh, created a, an agreement with, uh, with uh, Egypt, I believe, trying to give it 80 million euros, uh, to intercept people on the sea and return them to, to Egypt. So with this new agreement, there is a land repatriation already, which is just uh, engraving the situation worse than before, and we are expecting worse than this. Um, Jule, and then the mic is with another person. First. You, please. Uh, yeah, I don't really have a question. I was, we were just wondering how, um, like, if one wanted to get to Geneva, how you could get there. And I was just texting with a woman that is organized with uh, solidarity with refugees in Libya, and there is like a bus that's going from I think Berlin, and it's also traveling near Frankfurt. So if anyone wants to join, 
the protest, yeah, it goes from Berlin to Frankfurt and Freiburg and then to Geneva. And they you have to register on their website if you want to travel by bus. And they're also like in once you arrive in Geneva, there are sleeping sleeping <coughs> places there, so you don't have to like book a hotel or anything. Perfect. Thanks a lot for sharing. I guess this was the kind of information Hagen wanted to share with us, but I think Hagen will complete later on. Yeah, Thank I you very much. Yeah. It's always good to know. The information would, for uh, I need login to Peter. Uh, I wanted. Did you copy the bus information? Okay, Hagen is here and uh, he will provide all the information. Thank you. Okay, but we stay now. In the debate, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, the first thing I had to do was a really high-level talk for today. Also, just I think you know, in terms of how you organize politically under these conditions, um, and and fought for humanity. You know? um, I maybe it's just my personal wish that there were some experiences of solidarity with locals, but were there any? So people from the living civil society reaching out in a way to kind of tackle the dehumanizing um, situation. And um, second, um, thinking in terms of that concept of um, deterrence policies um, uh, that the um, externalization of borders and the dehumanization it creates is used as an instrument to keep people away from trying to migrate to Europe. Do you think this is a valid argument or a valid concept, and or doesn't it like work anyways because um, people do not choose to become a refugee and would do it anyways, and or uh, because it's well, the concept is just crap. To Thank you for <laughs> touching the part of the solidarity. I didn't mention it. Uh, <laughs> my brain was a bit scattered uh, during the protest. Uh, from the local communities, yes, we did uh, receive the support because uh, they were feeling it. They knew that uh, most of the time they have seen us on television and they never really felt what it means to be in the street. And when uh, they could pass by with their cars, they started feeling a, a sense of shame and pity. That was when they started to bring in these uh, shelters that were seeing some could come and drop uh, uh, a piece of bread to the people and some could come and uh, give shelters, water and uh, and so on but it didn't last long because uh, it, it lasted not more than a week the, the, the Libyan government came and then put guards whoever is passing by they got control and if you are taking <coughs> your food you get questioned if you are going to give it to these people so they stopped the cut tie to the support that was able, or that people were willing to give to us. We received from the beginning, but uh, due to the mafia system and the, the threat from the militias, the locals were not able to provide more support because even the Libyan civil society, uh, they came daily trying to provide uh, medical assistance, even if they were hiding, but they got discovered and then they were prosecuted. To this day, I speak to you, young Libyan activists are still held in, in the prison and they have been uh, undergoing uh, trials. They are accused of uh, whatever, uh, I don't know, treachery or tra they are like traitors to, to, their, to, their, to their country because they are trying to <laughs> say that Libya is not good, Libya is not respecting the international uh, human rights. Uh, that is why they are criminalized and they are being punished now for trying to help us. As for the border externalization, I think uh, looking at the people, uh, we are not just being used as uh, to, to be kept in these places because Europe doesn't want us. We are being used for political bargains. We the people are paying the price. We know that Europe <coughs> still knows that it is our right to migrate either coming to Europe, either going throughout Africa. And they still need people to work because when there is a society, we need people to work for us. Even in my country, I know that in South Sudan, given the poor condition, people still rent each other to work. 
which means people need a work for someone. The same towards migration. But since Libya is very corrupt, since the African head of the state are very corrupt, Europe is using these people to continue having a strong influence. For example, in Libya, when we look at the current situation in Libya, who destabilized the situation? How Libya was before in the 90s, in 2000, during the Gaddafi era? Libya was destroyed by NATO. And when we talk of NATO, is Germany not part of it? Is Italy not part of it? Is France not part of it? They destabilized the situation and then creating this mafia system for them to still have connection with the state and with the state actors in Libya, they created migration as an excuse and we are paying the price. This is what I can tell you because it's the only truth. Lion, would you like to, to react maybe also? No, this is not a reaction to this. <laughs> my, my thought goes into a completely other direction, but maybe I just say it. Um, to be honest, I have no questions to you because uh, if your brain was scattered and then I didn't realize it at all, uh, I think it was so much information at once that uh, it's incredible how you manage uh, but if you don't ask to you share this way. But I want, I want to reflect on something that you said because at some point I would slightly, there was only one point where I would slightly disagree and this is when you said that um, most of the people, they don't want to speak anymore about what they experienced in Libya. My experience, when I think back to what we had with Lampedusa and Hanau in 2013, so a long time ago, the, I had the first uh, discussions with people about their experiences in Libya and they were all horrible. But what my experience was, was that people often want to speak about it when they are asked. And then it makes sense to speak about it. And I think what you created in this moment that you were in front of the UNHCR in Tripoli, I mean, you spoke about democracy and you spoke also about the experience, how to give value what people say, even when they maybe uh, don't talk uh, with a scattered brain uh, like you talk then, but uh, to give value what people to what people say and what they experience. It. I think that is for many, many people uh, a very good experience then to speak. And I think what we lack somehow, and that is more a question <laughs> to all of us, I think what we lack, you say uh, refugees in Libya somehow got forgotten. And I think betrayed, that betrayed. betrayed and forgotten. But I think what we also forget sometimes is uh, to, to get organized together <coughs> here with people that they have the experience to, to talk about things. And I think we experienced that in this time of uh, Lampedusa and Hanau very strong because there was a strong reason to organize against the deportations back to Italy. And so people started speaking out about their experiences and they used it in a similar way, like you described uh, how, how, how you came to this decision to organize a protest there, because they, they said it's necessary that we are heard if we don't want to just lose without having spoken. And I think this is still the case. There is many, many people in all over Europe, they would speak if there would be enough solidarity, they would for sure bought a bus to go somewhere if the bus was there and people could organize it. Yeah, but they lack, they, they lack resources, maybe they lack time, and they lack uh, uh, an environment of solidarity that is really uh, giving value to their voices. And I think this is something that goes to all of us, that this is a necessity to create a, an atmosphere here and I, I think it was not only Greece, I think also about Libya. It is a, a strong eye of media on the sea rescue, but not on the people protesting in Libya. And I think it's on us to change that. That's the point. I think it's on us to change that and to, and to, to change the perspective and to give the voice to the people that experience uh, these things. And it's our role, from my point of view, here within Europe, to create an atmosphere that people feel it uh, valuable 
to speak out, and they feel safe enough to speak out because people will be on their side. I think that's the point, and I think that is somehow our job. And to add a little, I think uh, there is also one thing wh which uh, restrict people, which hinder people from this, is uh, when they are in the European uh, society and in host communities, they are told to integrate humans. When you tell them about integration, it feels like I'm integrating into something because tomorrow I'm leaving. But if we include these people in our society, in our decision making, in the networks that we build within Europe, then they can feel that they are part of this, which means we need inclusion. When we are included, inclusion, not integration. Thank you for adding, David. There is another. Um, <coughs> um, yes, can you? Um, I was going to ask because uh, last time I, I'm Libyan, and last time I was in Libya was like uh, a few months back. And um, a friend of mine is Somali, and his relative was actually like uh, held for ransom in Libya while I was there. So I was trying to um, get help and find out like what happened to him and where he is. And I try to call like UNH UNHCR a lot of times and IOM and I even had my cousin like go to their office and um, they would just like make up excuses and like not being helpful um, at all and not call back and all of these things. Um, and I was wondering if there is any way like if there are any structures that um, like I could be talking to like activists you know in Libya that are still active and aren't like um, detained by the government um, that I could like if I would get into the same situation or if I would be in Libya again and there was something happening like I could reach out to them and like find a way to help um, there yeah I think um, this situation varies from uh, one case to another um, and based on uh, the locations where these people are detained are held for ransoms uh, for us, uh, we constantly uh, cooperate with the Libyan activists who are not detained, as you say. And uh, at the same time, we try to look at uh, Wensmill. It's a, I don't know, United Nations support mission in Libya. Wensmill, so they are headquarters in Tunis. And uh, at least they have uh, a strong uh, power because they are backing up uh, the, the government in Libya. So what we do is we send them this information of the victims, where they are held, and then they cooperate with the same uh, government, of course, they know what to do. And then they go and uh, rescue these people in most cases. It doesn't work out, so we only collect funds and pay for these people because we value their life. <coughs> but uh, still it's worth trying to speak to these uh, local uh, uh, civil society activists because they have more information and they have more uh, uh, chances of getting to know the location of where the person has been detained and then uh, legal intervention can follow. And is there like a group or something outside of this um, governmental? Yeah, there are groups like, uh, for example, Biladi. Biladi for human rights, there is a, um, a man against discrimination. At least these uh, these two they are really active uh, in the field of migration. If you want details, I can give it to you, or you can contact uh, refugees in Libya. Yeah. I may not respond to you immediately, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, more high speed than yeah, Indonesia. We will, uh, we will uh, cooperate and work on it together. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, Hagen, would you like now to mobilize uh, for what also Marion was suggesting to create a space of solidarity and to share information and maybe this will be the start of getting more light onto the situation because I think it, in fact we know what is going on in Syria. Everybody who wants can know since years we have the reports and investigations, um, but it makes a big difference, I would say, David, to, to listen to somebody like you who experienced it from first hand in different stages and who always also was uh, involved in the organization of that uh, protest. 
Thank you very much. Uh, just a little, I think, uh, for the call to Genev, this there is a voice coming straight from Anzara. This is uh, my <coughs> colleague, uh, Hassan Zakaria. He's uh, still in Libya and he's uh, being persecuted by the Libyan government. And here I am. I cannot play my voice again. So <laughs> I will go to this voice from uh, inside the detention center, Anzara. I am a Sudanese refugee in Libya. Since I arrived in Libya, I have been arrested many times and I have suffered a lot. And the last time when the raid happened in Bulgaria, they arrested thousands of refugees there. But me, I could escape from that raid and I went to the UNHCR office with other thousands of refugees and asylum seekers. We have come be there for more than three months and we're calling the world to listen to what we were trying to. We wanted to pass our message to the public <coughs> and in the same time we were requesting for UNHCR in Libya to take us to a safe place. But unfortunately UNHCR did nothing for us. After spending three months and some days on the road protesting and demanding for our rights, <coughs> We were waited again from that camp at midnight in a very bad way. It was in 10th of January 2022, and we found ourselves in a Zara prison. And we expected from UNHCR to come and negotiate with the government and find a solution for us. But unfortunately, it didn't happen. Till today, we are kept in a Zara prison, <coughs> and we are controlled by militias. And UNHCR is ignoring us. The reality is that in Libya we are not treated as humans. <coughs> Despite all these ignorances and mistreatments, we keep calling the world to stand with us. I respond to you from the Zara prison. Thank you. Right, so this is the call from Anzara the concentration camp which I'm speaking about. These were people with me, they were <coughs> colleagues, they were human beings who wanted to have a voice and they protested. They, they endured more than three months with me, trying, helping, mobilizing people, how to speak for themselves. But for since January until this period, that is more than 10 months, they are still kept in this prison. And he's speaking from the so, would you be a voice to that? Okay, a few more information I about the Sudanese uh, refugee sorry. in Libya. Since I arrived in Libya. Technical mistake. Yeah. <laughs> a few information about it. If, if it works organizationally, technically, the idea is to have exactly this voice projected on the UNH, yeah. UNHCR. Had for the war. Yeah. On Friday, the lines, next week, Friday, 9th of December. We choose this day, one day before the International Day for Human Rights, to be in Geneva and to start as a press conference at 11 o'clock, hopefully reaching some journalists uh, to cover this story for the next day. And uh, we want to continue on this day with a sitting protest was mentioned by David, no? it was the main protest, a sitting protest in front of UNHCR in Tripoli, from Tripoli to Geneva, we want to, at least symbolically, no? to bring this protest in front of this headquarter, <coughs> and we, we have a, yeah, a manifestation in front of this, with several voices. We also want to include, just to mention it, protests in other North African countries, because we had a series of protests in the last years in front of UNHCR <coughs> because of similar problems. But this is, of course, the most escalated situation. But we had and have protests in Tunisia, in Morocco, in Sudan, in Egypt. And we also will talk about this in these hours in front of UNHCR. And uh, we decided, of course, it's a challenge in little time to stay there for 24 hours, so overnight at least with some people, and then to have a demonstration on Saturday. Uh, hopefully some of you will come on the Saturday for a demonstration. We cannot expect thousands, but we hope that mainly people from Switzerland, but also 
you mentioned the bus from, from Berlin and some people from Germany will come, but also from France yeah. and from Italy, some people will join these projects. So we'll see how many we are So and we ask, of course, everybody to join, still to join, because this bus is coming, as you said. We decided to have the bus not only for Saturday, but <coughs> to, we want to have the bus for Friday to support the press conference. David on the stage, these people on the wall. Uh, but this means, of course, to invest some, some days eh, of a protest. So the bus will start on Thursday morning already. Uh, we <coughs> will stop here in Frankfurt around 3 o'clock, so people still can come into the bus. And uh, with the uh, overnight in Freiburg, Freiburg friends will host the bus people for the night and will take care for food. But then early morning on Friday, uh, the bus has to continue to reach the UNHCR building in the morning at 10, 11 o'clock for the press conference. That is the plan. And then uh, to stay uh, for one day, we have, as you mentioned, we organized with some friends from Geneva collective sleeping places, warming up and sleeping places, not comfortable hotels, of course, but sleeping places. And uh, then uh, after the demonstration, probably at 5, 6, the bus will return uh, via Freiburg and Frankfurt back to Berlin. No? So we tried to, to do it with a Soli bus, you might know this project, good friends who have an own bus who already yeah, made a lot of tours with us in anti-racist projects, but also for other movements. So if anybody is still willing to join us, what would be wonderful, uh, uh, let us know, you can contact us, and it's still an option to start and to join the bus in Frankfurt. Um, Three o'clock that night? No, 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 three o'clock Thursday afternoon. Ah, wow. Because, again, Thursday morning, the bus from Berlin has to start so to be here at 3 o'clock and to be in the evening in Freiburg, to stay overnight in Freiburg, and the next morning, that is the Friday morning at 10, 11, to be in, in, in uh, Geneva. Uh, a small group, including David, will go earlier. Next Wednesday, he will be in Bern. Uh, to try to mobilize again. Yeah, of course, the most people will come from Switzerland, or hopefully will come from Switzerland, and we try to yeah, do the last preparations and organizational things with the friends in Geneva. Yeah, again, amplifying the voices no, is the main slogan. Thank you very much for uh, coming, for sharing. <laughs> to all those who are still um, blocked in Libya under those harsh conditions. Um, really all the best for, for the activity and uh, protests in Geneva. And really, we hope to have a lot of journalists who might upgrade the voices in other, in other spheres. So thank you very much. All the best and bye-bye.